Hey, Embassy City, how you all feeling? Sometimes we take our own for granted. Even the Bible says that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. But here at Embassy City, we honor our own. Amen? The woman that I'm about to present to you is our own. At the age of 18, she started full-time ministry. And for nine years after that, she served in the inner city in New York City and has been in ministry ever since. When this woman speaks, I listen because I know that she is a woman after God's own heart. So I want to present to some and introduce to others. She's an artist. She's a writer. She's a teacher of God's word. She's a wife and she's a mother. And her name is Katie Kazadi. Stand up on your feet. Let's honor the woman of God. Come on, Katie. Can you say preach the word? Teach the word. Amen. You're amazing. Thank you. Oh, I was not ready for that. Thank you, though. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, family. How are you doing today? Oh, you could do better than that. I've been up since 430. You are not going to let me out, do you? Today, uh, that's what's not going to happen is you're going to sit up in here, be quiet and make me do all the work. All right. So if you want this word today, say I'm about to get this word. I am um, <laughs> thankful to be here this morning. Um, I get the opportunity to preach a lot of places, but I will be honest with you and tell you this, that you are my favorite people to preach to. I said that to 9 a.m. too, just full disclosure. I don't know which message you'll hear later. I did say that to 9 a.m. too, but it's because I consider you all one, and you're my favorite people to preach to because there is something special about standing in a community of people who that you already know are hungry for the word. And I already know as soon as I open up the Bible, which is copy pasted into my notes, as soon as I open it up, that I have people that are prepared to listen and hear the word of God. So I just want to say thank you for always making ministry so easy for me. So, so easy. I love you guys. This morning, I figured um, the last couple of weeks, uh, Tim been just preaching the paint off the walls, right? Am I right? Anybody been here? And I'm super grateful for the move of the Holy Spirit and for all that. I just figured that the walls could use, the paint on the walls could use a little rest. So if you don't mind today, I come as a teacher. Is that all right? Can I teach today? If you're all right with that, somebody say teach. teach. However you want to end that, go ahead. Teach white girl, teach Katie, teach whatever you want to say. I'm all right with it all. I've heard it all. Um, but I come to you as a teacher. And I love to teach the most because I love to learn. I love to learn, and I love to look into the Bible and just really study it, because I always just feel, you know, like, I always feel like there's more. Tim and I were talking this week about the, the scripture that says that the unfolding of his word gives light, and really how we see the scriptures that way is something that can just keep being unfolded over and over again, and there's always another layer, and there's always another level. And so most recently, I had this desire that I really wanted to study the life of Saul, Old Testament Saul, uh, the king who ended very bad, I really just wanted to study his life, the rise and fall of Saul, uh, mostly because if I'm honest, one of my greatest fears is becoming Saul, that God would trust me with something very special, and I would end up ruining it and destroying it somehow, some way, without intending to. So I wanted to study the life of Saul because I just want to make sure that I don't become him. And the more I looked at Saul, I just, I just kept getting distracted by this guy who just kept stepping into the scene, into the picture named Jonathan. And today, I, I want to tell you, I didn't even get any, anywhere near studying Saul because I got so enamored with the life of Jonathan, I got stuck there that today, if you don't mind, I would like to teach to you from the entire book of 1 Samuel. Does anyone have lunch plans? <laughs> okay. Um, if you don't mind, what I want to do is I want to summarize the entire life of Jonathan in general, and then I want to go back and specifically set our focus on one moment, one day in his life that I think by the power of the Holy Spirit might inspire us to walk out of here and live a different life. Is that okay with you? So um, because 
of this, I'm going to refer to the Bible a lot during the, half, the first half of this message, but I will not get to actually a point where I read the text until later. And I say that for all of you who are like me, and when a preacher starts, you're like, you better read the scripture real soon because I'm not trying to hear nothing that's not from the Bible. So I will get to the scriptures, um, but I'm going to refer to a lot of it, and, that, and whatever I don't read is your homework, so write it down. So I want to talk to you about the life of Jonathan, and the title of my message today is A Time to Fight, A Time to Fight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you oh, that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you can take what is so ancient, these words that are so ancient, and make them new to us today. We pray that we would lean into your word, that our hearts would be good ground and so open to you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would mark my words with the manifest presence of God so that they go into every heart and every place. And I declare by faith that they shall not return void, that we will receive the word of the Lord and we will be forever changed. In Jesus' name, if you agree, somebody shout amen. 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 All right, I'm gonna start by talking about the timeline, okay? At what point in history we kind of meet Jonathan. We are introduced to Jonathan at a very critical moment in old time history. If you know the book at all, you know that right before the book of 1 Samuel is the book of Judges. It is a time in history that is wicked, depraved. I mean, it makes what's happening in America look like butterflies and I don't know what else. It was incredibly horrific. The Bible says it was a time when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It, it, the book of Judges ends with, with uh, people raping people to death, literally. That is the kind of time it was. And so God gets so disgusted by what's happening that he finds a woman named Hannah, and, in, and through Hannah, he births a prophet named Samuel, who will be the new leader. Now, he will bridge the gap between the leadership of judges to now the leadership of prophet, because God has decided, now the way I want to lead my people is through a prophet, someone who can hear my voice and speak my word. This is the way that God wants to lead his people, through Samuel, and he has done a great job for a very long time, and one day, silly children... These Hebrews wake up, the Israelites, and decide, you've been great, you've never led us astray, but we really think we would like a king. We would like a king. God doesn't want to give them a king. He doesn't want them to be led by a king. They demand a king. And so after they ask and ask and demand, God decides, okay, I'm going to go ahead and give you what you want, which is why you ought to be careful what you keep praying for after God says no, because sometimes you got to thank God for his no. So at a certain point, he goes, you know what? I'm going to give you a king. Here's your king. He's Saul. He finds Saul. And Saul is anointed king. And you need to understand a little bit about Saul because the life of Jonathan is always told, his story is always told in connection with two men, with David and with Saul. Saul is his father. Jonathan is Saul's son. So I want to tell you a little bit about Jonathan's daddy. Saul, Saul starts off really good, it seems like. He starts off small in his own eyes, like, oh, who me? Okay. Maybe it's false humility. I'm not sure. But either way, he starts off good, but he goes off the rails very quickly. Saul is the definition of a narcissist. His picture should be in the dictionary right beside the word. In fact, as I describe uh, Saul, every person who has dealt with a narcissist is going to be checking off boxes like, mm-hmm, yep, yes, mm-hmm. Saul is such a narcissist, he is plagued with both pride and security because pride is simply the mask that insecure people wear. He is extremely arrogant. He has a very deep need to be celebrated and to be seen, even if he doesn't deserve to be celebrated. Once he gets a crown on his head, it's like he loses his whole mind. And all of a sudden, he becomes a huge conspiracy theorist. He thinks everybody's out to get him, out to kill him, out to take his throne. He, the, one of the saddest parts about Saul is that though God trusted with them, him with his people, Saul actually never even really cared about the people that God gave him to lead. He could care less about the people and just more about the position. In fact, if it came down to it, he would have offered any and all of them up if it meant he could keep his crown. He has no sense of loyalty whatsoever, but he demands full loyalty from everybody else. Anybody know one of those? He's such a narcissist that when God finally decides to rip the throne from him and to end his time, he's such a narcissist that he asks and pleads not with the people to forgive him for hurting him, not 
not, he doesn't plead for God to forgive him. Instead, he pleads with Samuel to please just walk me before the people one last time and make it look like I'm worthy of the honor that you and I and God all know that I am not. Because he was obsessed with his image and not his integrity. So his last request is that they would just make it look like. He cares nothing about the wreckage he is leaving behind, about the people that had followed him and he was supposed to lead. He is unrepentant. He is entitled. He spends most of his entire reign as king instead of fighting enemies. He spends most of his reign trying to kill David. And the longer he reigns, the more we see him implode until the day he finally ends his story, his own story, as tragically as you could imagine, by taking his own life. And the Bible says on the battlefield, he fell intentionally on his own sword. Speaking of swords, you should know that during this time, one of the ways the Philistines have strategically planned to beat the Israelites is by making it to where they don't have weapons. They have the blacksmiths. And when you come to them, they don't sharpen your tools the same as they would their own intentionally. They have made it where their skills aren't enough. They have to come and they seek the world. They have to seek the Philistines to arm them. And at this point, the scriptures will tell us that all of the soldiers besides Saul and Jonathan actually have no weapon. They are completely armed. And the only people who have a sword is Saul or Jonathan. So when Saul takes his life with a sword, that sword represents his privilege. It was a privilege to have a sword, and the way he died was he fell on his own privilege. Let me give you another example of Saul in case I haven't made it plain what kind of person he was. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, you know, the Philistines are their enemy. He's a couple years into his 40-year reign, and he has done essentially nothing to deal with the enemy of God. And now he decides, hey, you know what? Maybe we'll build a little army. You know, maybe we'll just do a little something, possibly. And he summons the people, and 300,000 men up show up ready to go to war. And he sends home 297,000 of those men. He keeps only 3,000. And it says he divides them between him and his son, his young son, his inexperienced son. So the Bible says he doesn't divide them evenly. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, so he just gave more to his son. No, actually, he kept 2,000 and he sent his young, vulnerable son in with only 1,000. What kind of man would decide that he would rather leave his own son more vulnerable than himself? Jonathan's daddy, that's what kind of man and so while Saul is sitting around with his 2,000 men doing absolutely nothing, just him, they're just hanging out under trees and stuff, and they're still not doing absolutely anything, and Jonathan is over with his only, his 1,000, and while Saul's sitting around doing nothing, Jonathan decides this is not a time to sit, it's a time to fight. There is an enemy of our God out there, so he takes his 1,000 men, plans a sneak attack against the Philistine army that they was not ready for at all. They were just used to Saul doing nothing. And now Jonathan goes, let's just do something different today. He plans a sneak attack, and it turns everybody upside down. They kill a bunch of Philistines because Jonathan was about to prove to his daddy and to all of us that you do not need an advantage to win. That if you fight the right battles, you can win with whatever you have. That people, he said, you know what? Mm, this is not my enemy. This is God's enemy, which means the people God's given me is enough. And the weapons God has given me is enough. And the opportunity God's given me is enough. Because if God is with me, I have everything that I need. This is a time to fight. So Jonathan takes his little underman crew and commits the first act in what would be one of the largest, most epic wars in the Old Testament history. He pokes the bear. He upsets them. He stirs up the whole land. And it causes such a commotion throughout the land that Saul decides to make a big announcement so that he can rally all his troops because now he knows the Philistines are not happy. They're gathering all that they can. So he goes, he announces to his people, guess what? We had this great victory. We need you to come. And the only thing is he forgets one minor detail, and he tells them that the victory was his and not his son's. And he takes the credit for the win his son made. Who takes the credit from their own son? Jonathan's daddy. 
Jonathan is a fighter, so I'm waiting for him to swing back. Like, oh yeah, you're gonna try to take the credit for me while you're sitting over there? I mean, I just want him to at least just tell one person. I get you're not gonna make a big announcement, but I just wanna see him just lean over and whisper to one person's ear, like, you know that joke didn't do nothing, that was not him, that was all me. But Jonathan says not one word, not one word did he speak. Why? Because Jonathan always knew that there was a time to fight, and this is not it. Why? Because I have a real enemy, and my real enemy is not my father. So he can take the credit, but he can't take the win. You can take the credit, and everyone else can never know, but I'll never forget what it felt like to stand with my foot on the enemy's neck. I've still got the blood of a Philistine underneath my nails, so you can take the credit, but you can never take the win. I won't waste my energy fighting for credit because I'm busy fighting for a cause. And the thing that got me about Jonathan was that I took that boy, looked him up and down, left and right, flipped him upside down, shook him around. I searched everything I could to find one trace of his father in him. Let me see just a hint. Surely there's a hint of Saul somewhere. And I'm telling you, I looked as hard as I could look. And as hard as I looked, I could not find one trace of Saul in the fiber of Jonathan. And I appreciate this because I, maybe someone else in here can appreciate this, that this means that you can have a bad father and still be a great man. You could actually have no father and still be a great man. I learned from John, some of you are clapping because you're like, that's right, that's me, and that's right. You can have a bad father and still be a great man, and also it tells me something else, that it is possible to stop a generational cycle before it gets out of hand. <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan said, I'm not leaving this kind of cycle for my son or my grandson to try to break because a generation cycle, generational cycle is like a wheel that is moving and the longer it moves, the faster it goes and somebody has to be bold enough to put their arm into the wheel and turn it the other way and say, for the sake of my children, I'm turning this thing around because I will not see my kids move in the same direction as my father. And Jonathan said, this generational cycle stops here. So we learned that you can have a bad father, still be a good man, you can stop a generational curse, but this will set some other people free, a whole other group I'm coming for, and that is it means that you can also serve a toxic leader and come out clean. Yeah. Somebody, yes, yes, someone that's just echoing in your soul right now, I, I understand. It means it is possible. In fact, oftentimes, God will ask you to serve a toxic leader to see if you will come out clean. Later in the story, Saul actually tries to kill his baby boy, Jonathan, and the people, even though Saul's the king, refuse. No, we're not going to do it, not Jonathan, because Jonathan is fighting battles that you won't fight, and he's winning things for us. And this tells me this, Jonathan was more loved amongst the people than his own father. So if Jonathan was an opportunist like so many people are, he would have used that to his advantage and said, you know what, you're right, you saw how he tried to kill me, I'm only the one looking out for you, maybe we should overthrow him. He would have tried to start his own campaign and take that away from his father, but he said, no, 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 while my daddy's out here fighting for credit, I'm over here fighting for the purity of my heart, and I see my daddy's errors, but so does God, and I can trust God with so and here's where it gets really good is that Jonathan we forget was the heir apparent Jonathan was the next king all Jonathan had to do is sit tight and he was thinking it's okay my daddy's a hot mess 
But when I get this throne, I'm going to turn things around. I'm going to reign and I'm going to rule justly and I'm going to walk in the fear of the Lord and I'm going to do things right. All I have to do is wait for my daddy to do something crazy enough that somebody kills him, make somebody mad enough, or just have a heart attack and die because he's always stressing out. All I have to do is wait and I will have the power and I will have the legacy and I'll have the position and have the ability to lead. All I have to do to be king is wait as long as... Somebody doesn't come in and try to take it from me. All I got to do is wait and I'm going to be king unless, unless some little like shepherd boy from some little sheep wakes up one day, come with his little harp and his little sack lunch and unless some, some little kid has the audacity to step on my territory Little oil still dripping off his face and his slingshot. Unless some kid comes up in here trash talking the giant and trash talking all these people and and saying my daddy's gear ain't good enough. Unless some kid comes up here and tries to take the crown. I ain't got to watch the throne. But when he shows up, you understand what I'm saying when I say that if anyone should have hated David, it should have been Jonathan. It was Jonathan who was threatened by David. And if his heart isn't totally pure before God, this will be the moment it comes to the surface. This will be the moment you find out when David comes and threatens to take his throne. I expect Jonathan to feel threatened and start being like, you know what, if my daddy would have just given me the credit for those battles I want, I wouldn't have to prove anything. Maybe I just need to start letting some people know around here that I'm the one who started this holy war. Maybe I just need to let people know. But when David steps on the scene, Jonathan does something interesting. He just, he sits back and watches. Now remember, David was anointed king secretly. Because Samuel was so afraid of Saul that when God sent him to anoint him, Samuel said, Saul, gonna kill me. And he said, don't tell anyone. What you're going to do is just go in and say you're offering a sacrifice. So nobody but David and his brothers and his father knows that he has been anointed king. In the natural, Jonathan does not know that God has anointed him king. And now we find the first interaction between the two of them. And you're expecting some rivalry, some competition. But after David comes and he watches David kill that giant and he listens to the conversation that David has with his with his father saying, I can't wear your armor. And who are who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He watches every detail of that thing play out. And after it's done, first Samuel chapter 18, verse one, lets us know his response. After David had finished talking with Saul. Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, and he gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. We find here that Jonathan does not know by the flesh, but he senses by the spirit of God. When he looks at David, look, I see something different on you, David. I'm I'm looking at you, and I know the oil is already dried, but I can still see the oil on you. I recognize the anointing on your life, David. And I don't know that in the natural, but by the spirit, I understand in this moment that you've got next, which means I don't. You're the next king. And it's not that you're better than me. And it's not that God has rejected me. I don't feel rejected. I know who I am. It just means that God has chosen you. And this is not the time to fight. I don't want to fight for your crown. I'm fighting for a kingdom. And he says this, he recognizes something on him and he says, listen, I don't have a crown yet to give you, but I'm going to give you the next best thing. And he begins to humiliate himself in his position and disrobe. He takes off his outer garment. He takes off his tunic and he gives it to him. And he says, I know my daddy's stuff doesn't fit you, David, but I, I understand that my daddy's stuff didn't fit you, but that's because you're built different. And I've been looking at you and watching. You're not built like him, but you're built like me. I think my stuff will fit you, Jonathan, because we're built different. So you can't fight with his, but try this. How about I give you mine? I don't have a crown to give you, but can I at least give you my sword? 
And he takes off his garments and he puts it on David. This is the equivalent of him just giving him the crown right now. And he takes his sword and he takes his bow and arrow. He disrobes and he disarms and he gives it to him. And he makes a covenant with him that he will keep till his last breath. So even though Jonathan should have been the one that wanted to kill David, he spent his whole life keeping him alive. Only God could do that. The interesting to me, thing to me was this idea that just watching David beat Goliath made him feel like they were one in spirit. What, what, what did he see that made him feel like they were one in spirit? And I think that to understand this, you got to go back to chapter 14. After the first win where his daddy takes the credit, Philistines rally the troops and they come at them so hard with so many people and chariots and weapons that it says Israelites are all just running scared. They are hiding anywhere they can. They're hiding in caves, it says. It's so desperate that some of them literally, they can't find a place to hide. And so they defect and they go to the other side and say, please don't kill me. I'll just help you kill my own people. This is what is happening. And the army has dwindled down to only 600 people. And this is when Saul looks around and starts counting. He gets nervous. He got the audacity to try to offer a priestly sacrifice when he is not a priest because that is just the kind of narcissist that he has. God decides, this is the day I've decided you will not have this throne. And only 600 men are left. Saul decides to sit around with them again, just waiting for them to attack, just sitting on the defensive, doing nothing only Saul and Jonathan have a weapon, 600 men unarmed, except for Saul and Jonathan. In chapter 14, it says this, one day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, it's the morning, he's like, wakes him up, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gebeah under a pomegranate tree in my groan. With him were about 600 men. And I'm going to fast forward. It says this. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. He's, he don't care about no credit anymore. He knows whatever happens, either I'm going to die with what I'm about to do, or I'm going to have the credit taken by my daddy, so nobody even needs to know. I'm just going to go do this. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes and the other Sinna. And one cliff stood to the north toward Michmash, and the other stood to the south toward Geba. And Jonathan said to his young bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. And if they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay there, we'll stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up that cliff because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. In other words, I have a holy inclination that God wants to do something, but I'm not sure. We'll figure it out for sure. When we get there, we'll ask God to confirm it. So both of them show themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. Jonathan says, say less. <laughs> now they're threatening him because they know that where they are, there's a cliff on either side and it is practically impossible that there's no way this kid who they don't even recognize, they don't even know who he is because... This day, he uses the fact that his daddy took the credit to his advantage. So they don't even know who he is. Just some Philistine they think is crawling out of his hole. And they challenge him to come up because they think there's no way. The whole reason we're here is because it's impossible to breach our territory. So they say that. But Jonathan says, oh, that's my cue. That means God is for me. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Come up. Okay, here we go. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me, which is a beautiful picture of leadership. He said, I'll go first. I'll take the risk first. Climb up after me. 
And Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet. He's climbing up a rock cliff, and he has no idea that all the crazy stuff that he did in his life has trained him today to be able to climb a mountain he never thought he would have to climb, an impossible mountain. And he's climbing hand and foot, and it says his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in the area of about a half an acre. Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field, and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. There was an actual earthquake. The ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Now this day reminds me a lot of the day that David met Goliath. It says, it starts off by just saying one day. The author is letting us know this was not a special day. Nobody else thought this day was any different than any other day. It was an ordinary day like the day that David woke up and was told to go bring the boys some lunch. It was just an ordinary day to everyone else. But something in Jonathan, he wakes up different. He just wakes up like feeling feisty. I don't know if you ever woke up like that. He just woke up like, you know what? You know what? These guys over here, I know they're not attacking us, but I don't like the way they're looking at me. I mean, I feel like, I just don't like the way they're looking at me. And today I feel like picking a fight. I just woke up different. I woke up like this. I got, I just got something in my spirit. Like, don't look at me like that. This enemy is not attacking yet, but I don't like how close they are. And he says, and he says to the guy, like, like, look, let's just go. Nobody will even notice we're gone. And that's perfect because the fact that daddy always took the credit means nobody will see me leaving and the enemy won't even see me coming. I'm going to use it to my advantage. Y'all won't see me coming and I don't care because everything I fought for has prepared me for this day. And he's looking around. He's like, all these people just sitting around here waiting to be attacked. I don't understand because that is not our enemy. That's God's enemy. That is an uncircumcised Philistine. He calls them exactly what David calls Goliath. He challenges them. Those Philistines are uncircumcised, which means they don't have a covenant with God. And while everybody else is counting and saying that we are numbered, you're counting, but I'm weighing. And there is a weight on me. I have a covenant with me. I carry something in the spirit. They outnumber us, but we outweigh them. And he's telling his armor bearer, come on, we got something. I don't care what anybody else has said. I I feel like all of heaven is waiting on someone who will have the courage to start a war they can't win, to be violent enough to go into the enemy's camp and just take it by force and believe, you know what, this is a battle I can't win and it's a battle God can't lose. He says, I got too much weight to wait. Carry too much weight in this covenant to feel like I'm outnumbered. Perhaps, what if, I don't even know I don't even know if this is going to work, but if I'm going to die, I'm going to die fighting. And something in my spirit says this is the time to fight. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or few. In other words, who said we need more than what we have to win? Who said we have to wait to be attacked and that we can't go right up into the enemy's camp like David who said, who said this giant is too big to fall? Who said I got to wear your armor? Who said a little shepherd boy? and a sling couldn't take down what everybody else is afraid of. Who said? And Jonathan just woke up different. He woke up ready to pick a fight with the enemy. He just woke up like I wish the enemy would. Look at me like that one more time. I wish he would start to mess with my family. You know what I wish? I wish the church of Jesus Christ would get a little bit more violent like Jonathan say, I wish you would. Who would wake up and say, I'm not waiting for you to attack my integrity. I'm fighting for it today. I'm not going to wait for the enemy to come attack my marriage. I'm going to get up and I'm going to fight for it today. I'm not waiting for you to try to destroy my ministry. I'm going to get up and I'm going to fight for it today. I'm not waiting to be attacked. I've been told that the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. And last I checked, gates don't fight, baby. All they do is guard territory. So the only way a gate prevails is by keeping you out of their territory. And the church of Jesus Christ is a church that's violent enough to prevail against the gates of hell, which means we are called to storm the gates. Jonathan looked at David and he said, I like you because you didn't wait for the giant to attack you. 
you look that giant in the face and say, I don't like the way he's looking at me. I don't like the way he's looking at any of us. I don't like the way he's talking. His breath smells. I don't care. I'm going to find some reason to be mad enough today to fight. If I never make it home, I don't care because this right here is worth fighting for. Jonathan got one guy. He went straight into the enemy's camp, slayed all 20 men, and it says the earthquake, and I believe that that was the sound of a standing ovation as God's feet hit the floor of heaven, that it shook the earth, and he stood up and said, that's what I'm talking about, baby boy. You step into the enemy's camp, I'm going to back you up every single time. You fight for a cause and not for a crown, I'm going to back you up every single time. And God says, I'll back it up. And it is the earthquake that sends terror throughout the Philistine camp because they know this was not just Jonathan and his boy. This was the God of Israel that acts on their behalf. You fast forward now. He's looking in the face of David. And he's watching this. He's like, you remind me of somebody. You remind me of myself. And I'm so thankful to know that if God is going to take the crown from Saul, he's going to get to someone who's built like me. And if I can't give you the crown today, I'm going to give you my sword. Because I'm a fighter, but this is not the time to fight. I'll storm the gates of the enemy, but I'll never lay a finger on you. Because there's a time to fight And you and I are going to fight together. Jonathan died like he lived, fighting on a battlefield, fighting the enemy. As I close, I have to tell you that as I was studying the life of Jonathan, I got a lot of answers from my own personal life. I learned a lot and I got a lot of answers about Jonathan, but it left me with some questions about God. Can we be real? Left me with some questions about God. I look at the way that he lived his life, and I say to God, would you really, would you really let this kind of life go unrewarded? I mean, I've searched the scriptures, and it's so I don't find another guy with as pure of a heart as Jonathan a fighter, a warrior for you, would you really let that kind of integrity, that kind of honor and service go unrewarded? And number two, did he have to die like that? I mean, he left behind a five-year-old son. Is that really how you do people who serve you well, God? And God said to me, first of all, You have assumed that there is another way that Jonathan would have rather died. But you don't know Jonathan. There's no other way Jonathan would have wanted to die except for out on that battlefield fighting the enemy like he always did. And second of all, you assume that he never got a crown. But I'm looking right in his face. And I crowned him myself. And Katie, you know what he did? When I placed that crown of life on his head, he took it off and he laid it at my feet. Because that is the kind of man Jonathan was. He didn't live for a crown. He lived for a cause. And he lived for a kingdom. So I say, but God, what about his son? You know, a man who dies, the one thing he does care about is the family he leaves behind. And God, I could live without a crown, but what about the legacy that I was supposed to leave behind? What about my son? And 2 Samuel chapter 9 tells us the story. It's about 15 years later, after Jonathan's death, And David is still grieving his friend's death. Because he always thought 
like Jonathan did, that they were going to serve together. I'm going to be king, and you're going to be right behind me. We're going we're to do this together. He never expected to lose Jonathan on the battlefield before he ever became king. He's still grieving Jonathan. He wakes up one day, and what happened was when Jonathan was killed, everybody, because they, any family of Jonathan is a, is a family of Saul, so they knew that anyone from Saul's line was going to get wiped out because how evil he was. So everyone in Jonathan's family had either been killed already or had run. And the Bible tells us exactly what happened to his five-year-old son. And it says that the woman taking care of him when his daddy died picked him up and tried to run to protect him and to save him. And while she was running, she dropped him and she broke both of his legs. And in those days, there was no cure for that. So he would be now for the rest of his life, he would be crippled in both legs. His name was Mephibosheth. And one day David wakes up and he calls his people. He goes, guys, 15 years later, I still haven't forgotten that man. Is there anyone left? Is there not anybody left that I can honor? Since I can't honor my friend, is there anyone? And they search because they think everybody's dead and they find out, well, he does have a son who was five, he was dropped, and now he's a cripple, just so you know. And David says, bring him to my house. So this guy about 20 years old, he has spent his whole life hiding because he knows if anybody finds out who he is, he's gonna be killed. He's been crippled and hiding all these years. And he comes to David's house and the Bible says that he is afraid because he thinks that David brought him there to kill him. And David goes, oh, you don't need to be afraid. I didn't bring you here to kill you. I brought you here to tell you a story about the father that you never knew. He says, I didn't bring you here to kill you. I bring you here to bless you. And he says, look, I know you never got to know your daddy. I'm filling in the blanks. I, I imagine this conversation. I know you never got to know him because he was gone at five and people have said a lot of stuff and I want you to know the truth that your, your father was a good man. He died fighting. He's the only reason that I'm still here. Your father was a man of integrity and all you've ever heard is how you're related to Saul but I want you to know that your real bloodline is a man named Jonathan, a man of integrity, a man of honor who served God faithful. You, you have a different legacy than you think and he says, I know you thought you were coming to get killed but I want you to know that this is the best day of your life, Mephibosheth, because today I have decided that even though you will never get to sit at the table with your father as king, the king's table. From now on, from the rest of your life, you will sit at the king's table with me. And the legacy it seems he have lost, David restores and says, you have a place at this table for the rest of your life. And not only that, not only do I want you at this table every night with me for dinner, breakfast, and lunch. On top of that, everything that was to be Saul's inheritance at this moment right now belongs to you. I am granting to you everything that should have been your Saul's and should have been your daddy's. It's yours. In fact, let me call these guys over here. These guys right here, they work for you now. And Mephibosheth, his whole life changes that day. And I believe many conversations happened at that table where David got to tell him about the father that he never knew and tell him that I know it seems like you lost your daddy tragically, but the fact that you're at this table is your sign that God does honor a life of integrity, that he does. In fact, this was never really about David wanting to honor Jonathan as much as it was about God wanting to honor Jonathan. And everything he should have lost, the entire legacy he should have lost, is now regained in one day. He said, your son will live. God said, your son will live just like you were the king. And as they were singing this morning, that last song, let all the other names fade away. I felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me. He's told this whole message about, we talked about Jonathan, 
about David, about Saul, about all these kings. But for a moment, I want you to let all those names fade away and come back to that table with David and Mephibosheth because this is actually all really about the gospel. This is all really about Jesus. See, David was a type of Christ who got up one day and decided to reach outside of his own bloodline, outside of his own, and to find someone outside. By the way, you are Mephibosheth. You are the broken, the crippled son who has been invited to the table and given a place. And he never said to Mephibosheth, you can stay here as long as you do this or as long as you do that. No, you have a place at this table because I have invited you here. You belong here with your broken feet, with your broken life exactly who you are and so I've asked the worship team to come out and we want to I want to close with that let all the other names fade away because if you leave this place and you forget everything else about Jonathan if you forget everything else about David I want you to remember this that there is a table that you have been invited to and you have been invited by Jesus himself and I wonder if there might be someone in this room who needs to respond to the call to follow Jesus. Why don't you just come? Why don't you just come? Why don't you just come? Someone, God stopped this. We didn't do this in the first service. God stopped this whole service to invite someone to the table, to invite somebody to the table, to invite you there and saying, bring your crippled feet to this table because they belong here. And so in a moment, we're going to sing this song and our prayer team is going to come. And if that's you, or if you need prayer for another reason, if God has spoken to you through this message about anything and you need prayer, I'm going to invite you to come. But if it's not you, if that's not you, I want us to stand and just to declare before we leave that there is a king, that there is a king whose crown cannot be taken. And he's Lord over every situation in our life. He's Lord today. He was Lord yesterday. He'll be Lord tomorrow. This is God's church. You belong to a king and you belong at his table. and rich word we received this morning, this afternoon. I don't know where you found yourself in that story. 
if you see yourself as Saul or if you see yourself as David or if you see yourself as Jonathan or even Mephibosheth. I don't know where you are in this story, but in the earlier service, Katie prayed that God would speak to you even on your drive home about who you are in this story and how God is going to show up for you, how he's going to impress upon you that it's time to fight, that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of Jesus Christ, and therefore we fight. And one way of fighting is by getting prayer. And so if you are here and you need prayer about anything under the sun, I want you to know that we have an altar team that's here to pray with you and for you. If that is not you, you are freely dismissed. We thank you for being here. We're going to continue to sing a little bit, but you're free to go or you're free to receive prayer. Thank you for being here.